Beginning in verse 38, we're going to read a story about Jesus and his interaction between himself and two of probably some of my favorite women in the Bible, Mary and Martha. Familiar story to most of us, but beginning in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Probably one of my favorite interactions between Jesus and Mary and Martha. There's a few other interactions in the book of John and some other places. But here we see in the book of Luke, Jesus interacting with these two women in a very powerful way. And what we end up learning about Mary and Martha is that they're very different. Mary and Martha operate at different frequencies. They are involved in different things, and they are concerned about different things. And one of the things I think we learn from Mary and Martha is a lesson on margin. What is margin? You've been driving down the freeway, and you find yourself creeping up a little bit too close to that car in front of you. You're driving just a little bit too close to that car in front of you, and you haven't given yourself enough buffer. You haven't given yourself enough wiggle room or stopping room and a cat runs out into the middle of the road and they slam on their brakes and then you don't have enough time to stop before slamming into the back of their car. You have been driving without margin. We understand what margin is a lot in our lives and Martha has no margin. Mary, on the other hand, is a shining example of margin. What we're going to talk about in this lesson really is learning from these two women a lesson about overcoming overload. If there is a lesson, if there is a topic that applies to us more now in our modern 21st century world, it is margin. We all need it, but we all struggle to find it. Have you ever found yourself stressed out, overloaded, overwhelmed? Feeling like you're burning the candle at both ends. You look at your to-do list, you look at your calendar, and everything is maxed out. You look at your bank account, you look at your budget, and you're just stretched too thin. And what we see here in this story of Mary and Martha is exactly the thing we need to learn today, some lessons we need to learn about how to find margin in our own lives, how to make space in our own lives for the things that are important. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. Let's start by looking at Mary, because Mary, I love, she is the perfect, I'm not perfect, she's not perfect, but she is, she is a great example in this case of somebody who has margin. Let's look at some of the things that she is. She is focused. Notice where she is in this story. She is sitting at the Lord's feet, verse 39, listening to his teaching. She is hearing what Jesus is saying. She's sitting at his feet. She is focused on Jesus. There's a lot of stuff going on in this story. There's a lot of of moving parts here. But Mary isn't concerned about those things. She is focused on Jesus, paying attention to him. She is relaxed. Wouldn't you like to be relaxed? (laughs) Our family just recently took a vacation a couple of weeks ago. And I will tell you, I was very relaxed on that vacation. It was a wonderful vacation, a time of refreshing and relaxing and not more than 12 hours back home and I was out in the middle of it. There was my to-do list, there was my calendar. This lesson I originally preached the day after we got back from vacation. (laughs) And I'm thinking, I would wanna be relaxed. And when I look at Mary, I see someone who's relaxed. She's sitting. At the feet of Jesus, how much more comfortable can you be when you're, when you're sitting? She is unconcerned. She's not worried. She's not concerned about what's going on, about all the moving parts around her, about the fiddly details of, of serving and everything else that Martha is worried about. Mary is unconcerned. And one of my favorite words, she is present. You know what it means to be present, right? You ever go to the restaurant, you see the two 
people, the, the, the happy couple sitting across from one another eating their dinner, and they're both focused on their phones, right? They, they're, they're in Instagram world and Facebook land, and wherever they are, they might as well not even be there at the meal together because they're not there with each other. They're, they're, they're so far from where they are. But, but here we see Mary, who is, she's present. She's there. She's listening. And she's absorbing what Jesus is teaching. Now, Mary is the great example here of the two. She's the one who has, as Jesus was going to go on to say, she is the one who has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. She is the good example here. So then you look at the flip side. Of it, and you look at Martha. Martha, on the other hand, in polar opposite form from Mary, is distracted. What is she doing? Well, she's, as it says here in verse 40, Martha was distracted with much serving. I mean, there's, make no bones about it. The, the Bible here clearly says what she was. She was distracted. She was so busy serving. She was so busy doing all of this work. She was, as Jesus points out to her in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled. You ever been anxious? You ever been troubled? I have. By the way, this is a lesson for me. This is, this is a lesson I need, especially in our modern culture, but even in my own life, even just recently. I need this lesson because I very easily can become anxious and troubled. And that's not something that Martha gets a pass on, by the way. Jesus doesn't just look at Martha and say, oh, well, it's not, bad. It's not a big deal. No, he points it out to her and says, this is a problem. You, you, you shouldn't be anxious and you shouldn't be troubled. But she's anxious and she's troubled and she is distant. You ever gone to a party and the host of the party is running around and getting everything ready and, and you, you barely even see them like you know it's their house. And they've, they, they waved hi to you when you came in, but like for the rest of the party, they were just gone and busy and doing things. And, and you might as well just not have even been at their house because they didn't know you were there. They were busy. They were distracted. They were distant. And that's what Martha is. She's trying to get everything ready. She's trying to get the meal ready to go. And she's distant. She's not there with Jesus. Hi, my name is Brian, and I am Martha. Have you ever felt yourself connecting with Martha? You ever feel like Martha? I have. I do. And it's something that I continually struggle with because as a type A personality, and if you are a type A personality, you know what that kind of personality is. As a type A personality, I'm somebody who is driven. I'm motivated. If there's a block in my schedule that's empty, ooh, what can I fill it with? What can I stick in there? What can I busy myself with? What can I do? And if you're that kind of personality, you are probably a lot like Martha. Busy, worked up, stretched too thin, and operating without margin. And Martha is not the ideal. Martha is not the one that we should be like. And so we're going to look at some lessons here in just a little bit from these two women. But what I want us to see is that margin as a, as a basic definition, margin is the amount available beyond what is necessary. If you had to define margin just from a technical definition, margin is the amount available beyond what is necessary. We can have margin in our time. We can have margin in our money. We can have margin in our energy. We can have margin in so many things in our life, so many areas of our life. And it's a practical kind of thing to think about because it really does touch so many aspects of our life. So many aspects of our life. If we operate without margin, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. And we're going to find ourselves anxious and stressed and distracted and burning the candle at both ends. But in thinking about margin just from like a monetary perspective, for example, if you make $2,000 a month, and the amount that you require in that month to spend on necessities and things that keep you living and keep you going equals $2,000 that month, well, then you have no margin. You have no buffer. You have no ability to save. You have no wiggle room. 
in our money, though, so oftentimes in, in our society, especially in the 21st century, what we do is we have, we, we have $2,000 a month coming in and we commit ourselves to spending $2,500. We overextend ourselves and we actually, we go into the negative and we extend ourselves too far. Now in our time, it's hard to do that because in our time, there is only 24 hours in the day, right? You can't spend more time than is allotted to you within a day. But what happens so often with many of us is we wake up in the morning, we have this to do and then that to do and then this other thing to do and we've got our, we've got our whole day blocked out. We've got everything just jam packed. And if we're just the slightest bit late for this one thing, it's gonna throw off the whole rest of the day. You ever been there? And here's the thing too, margin is something that's different for all of us. Our struggles with margin are different for all of us. I am the kind of person who if I have to be somewhere at eight o'clock and it takes me 20 minutes to get there, I'm leaving at 7.05. I'm, I'm leaving early, right? Because who knows what's gonna happen? You know, we were driving here tonight and. And I always forget about the, the football games and everything. And, and we got to be here at five and, and we're, we're not sure what the traffic is going to look like. And, and we left it quarter after four and even that was pushing it. Well, what would have happened if the freeway was closed and I had to be late preaching a lesson on margin? Well, that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> I struggle with margin in different ways though. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an early bird. I like to get there early, but I struggle with margin in a lot of different ways overextending myself in my commitments. I'm the kind of person who can't say no to things. If somebody asks me to do something, I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna say, yeah, sure, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll take care of that. And then all of a sudden, before I know it, my to-do list is just ridiculously long and I'm overwhelmed and I'm stressed out because I've said yes to too many things. And so you might struggle with margin in different ways than Martha did, I might struggle with margin in different ways than Martha did, but it will touch your life in some way. And so this is a personal kind of lesson for you to look at your own life introspectively, thoughtfully, and think about what do I have trouble regarding margin in my life? Now, if you think this is just a 21st century idea, I think you'd be wrong because our God is a God of margin. You ever thought about this? You ever thought about how God has, from the very beginning, instilled a sense of margin in his people? There are seven days in the week, right? And for his children, the children of Israel, you were not allowed to work on one of those days, and that day was called the Sabbath. If you had work to do on the Sabbath, sorry, buddy, you're not doing it on the Sabbath. And so you have seven days in your, in your allotment, but you only have six days to work with. And that seventh day was dedicated to God, not working, not doing selfish things. And as Jesus would talk about in his ministry, he would say the Sabbath was not a punishment for man. The Sabbath was created for man. The Sabbath was built so that man could rest, so that man could focus on God, so that man could stop doing selfish pursuits and doing things that filled their own pocketbooks and lined their own coffers. The Sabbath was created so that man could focus on God and God wanted his people to set aside a day for him. And so he called them to do that with the Sabbath, but also the tithing. If you think about the amount that you make, 100% of it is not yours. In the old law, the command was to give 10% to, to the, the treasury, to give 10% to the temple, to give 10% back to God. And so if you needed 100% of your proceeds to live, well, you're in big trouble because you don't have 100% of your proceeds. You only have 90%. And in the new law, we're not commanded to give or directed to give in the exact same way, but we are told to give as we prosper and as we purpose, and even still today in the church, we have a portion of what we give that we give back to God and to help the service of the church and to help the work that goes on here. That's what we still do today.
But you think about the amount of money that you make, it's not all yours. Not even today, and, and even back with God and his children in Israel. And you look at the harvesting principle, and I love this one, because if you were a farmer back in the Old Testament, you had a visible amount of margin that you had to create when you were harvesting your field. Let's say you have a 10-acre field, and you're out there, you're harvesting all of your crops. Well, you were commanded to leave the corners of your field. Remember that rule? Why were you commanded to leave the corners of your field? So that the sojourner and the poor could come and take and glean from your harvest and eat. God forced his people, commanded his people to build margin into their harvest to do good for other people. And that's what I hope we'll see from this lesson. Margin is not so that we can kick up our feet in our hammocks and just chill out and relax. Margin is built. Margin is something we need so that we can be using that time to do good things, better things. Things like Mary chose, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to good, important teaching on the kingdom. And so God has always been a God of margin, and I think we need to see that in our life. We need to see that God wants us to live this way. So let's make five just really brief observations from this text in Luke chapter 10 on the topic of margin. We'll talk about some things that, that we can get from this lesson between Mary and Martha and why margin is so important in our lives. First, margin starts with what we value. What did Mary value? Hearing Jesus, right? She valued hearing Jesus. She valued listening to the Messiah. She valued sitting there and, and learning from him. And by the way, that's no small thing. In the Jewish society, it would have been pretty unheard of for a woman to be sitting at the feet of a rabbi. That was not very common. And Mary sitting at Jesus' feet was not only amazing just on the surface of it, but it was amazing that that was what she valued. She, she really did want to hear the message of Jesus. Now, what did Martha value? Martha valued serving, hospitality. Martha valued cooking. Martha valued preparing a meal. Now, I want, you to, I want you to just think about what Martha valued. Is what Martha valued a bad thing? I think we would all do well to take a lesson from Martha on hospitality, don't you? I think we would all do well to listen and, and look at the willingness of Martha to serve and to care for her guests and to prepare a meal for them. I think she was doing a good thing. And that is the challenge of margin sometimes. Is because, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, sometimes what we busy ourselves with is still good. But as Jesus said here, there was something that was better. There was something that was better. You have chosen the good thing but Mary has chosen the better thing. That's not exactly what Jesus says, but I think that's what the point that he's making. You're doing good. You're serving. You're, you're helping. You're being hospitable. Great. Thumbs up. But you should be doing something more important than that. And that's kind of what Jesus says. That's not kind of. That's exactly what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. What are all of the things that he was talking about there? Well, they were so worried about their clothes, what they were going to wear, what about their bodies and their physical health, about the food that they were going to eat. They were so worried about all those things. And what Jesus says is, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That stuff will be taken care of. And isn't that kind of what Jesus is saying to Martha here? It's almost the exact same thing, right? He's almost preaching the Sermon on the Mount again to her. You're so anxious. You're so worried. You're so distracted. Focus on the kingdom. Focus on what's most important. And that's what he said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he says to Martha. And if he could speak directly to us today in person, face to face, I'm sure that's exactly what he would say in the 21st century. Quit worrying so much about what is going on worry about the kingdom. Focus on the kingdom. We also see that without margin, 
stress increases and relationships suffer. And that's what we see from Martha, right? Her stress levels are super high. She is so stressed out. And he says to her in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You're just so anxious. You're so worried. And her relationship is suffering because where is she not? She's not sitting at Jesus' feet. And when we are so busy, when we are so overcommitted, when we're so overtaxed and overspent, when our volume knob is turned to 11, so to speak, and we're just always operating at peak capacity, we don't have enough time to spend in our relationships with God. We don't have enough time to spend in our relationship with his word. We don't have time enough to spend with his people. And our relationships suffer because we're so busy. And our stress levels go up. Martha was so stressed out, in fact, she comes to Jesus in verse 40 and she says to him, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me then. <laughs> I find this amazing, right? What does she expect Jesus to say? Oh, well, Martha, you're right. This lazy woman over here, she's just idly sitting by doing nothing. Of course she should help you. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? Jesus turns to Martha and says, no, you're the one who's not doing the right thing. And so our stress levels go up and we start lashing out. We start acting irrationally. We start saying things that don't make any sense. And our relationships suffer because of it. What Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Come to me, all who, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. What does Jesus want us to have? He wants us to have rest. Does he want us to be running around stressed out, just lashing out at people, acting irrationally, our relationships suffering? No, he wants us to come and, as he says in Matthew 11, learn from me. What was Mary doing? Learning from him. He wants us to sit at his feet. He wants us to stop being so stressed out. He doesn't want us to be operating like Martha. Even today, even in our lives, he wants us to come to him and find peace and find rest. And lest you think that is sitting in a hammock, note what he says. He says, take my what? Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is, right? Farmer, country, oxen, Cattle. I don't even know what I'm talking about because I've never actually put a yoke on anything in my life. But I've seen them. I know what that looks like. It's work. And that's what he calls us to do. He still calls us to work. He still calls us to be busy and, and to, to give ourselves to him. But he doesn't want us to be stressed out with this life and be anxious with the cares and concerns around us. Here's the thing, though. We need to say no to good things so that we can say yes to better things. And this is where I think we have the biggest problem. Because what happens in the moment? You're in the middle of being busy. You're so busy and caught up. You're doing this, you're doing that. You've got this going on. Your to-do list is a mile long. Your calendar is maxed out. Your budget is maxed out. And you, and you say, these things are important. Well, if they weren't important, why, were you, why would you be doing them anyway? You think in the moment that all of that stuff you're busy with is so important. And it's hard sometimes to say no to those things that you think are good and important and necessary. And this is where I say this is different for everyone. I don't know what good things you need to say no to. I can look introspectively in my life and I can see what good things I need to let go of. There are plenty of times where there will be a, a Bible study at someone's home and I haven't seen my family all week. And you know what I have to say? I'm sorry. I can't be there because I need to be with my family. Being with my family is the better thing. And I have to say no to a good thing. And, and you and I will all be different in what good things we need to say no to. Martha should have said, you know what? We can eat out tonight. <laughs> that's what she should have said. I know that's a lot harder back then, but certainly she should have just not worried about it. And sometimes we just need to say, you know what? 
I'm not going to make the 19 pies for, for dinner tonight. You know, I'm not going to worry about all this. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? And we'll worry about the better things. And, and, and I honestly wish, I do wish, as somebody who preaches this lesson and thinks about it myself, I wish I could just give you, like, here are the seven things you need to say no to. But I can't do that. I can't. Because as Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, we walk through this world in a very, very day-to-day -day kind of way, don't we? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. If you know anything about wisdom, and you cross-reference this with the book of Hebrews, you know that wisdom is about discernment. And you know that discernment is about holding up two things side by side and saying, which one of these is better? Which one of these is, is the right choice? And that is different for everyone. And you have to day by day make that decision. What is better, this or that? And walk every day carefully, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's what we should always be asking. What does God want me to do today? How does God want me to spend my time today? How does God want me to spend my money today? And if we have that thought in mind, then it'll be a lot easier to say no to good things in order to say yes to better things. Are we tracking? I think hopefully everyone's following along here. This point is one of my favorites. Margin is often mistaken for sinfulness. Here's the problem. Kind of think about that for a second. Mary has margin, doesn't she? Mary has the time and the space required to sit at the Lord's feet. What does Martha come and do? Jesus, tell that idle, lazy woman to get to work. Right? I can't tell you how many times I have been Martha in this case, where I have been so busy and so stressed out and so maxed out, and I look around and I say, well, look at that person. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. And I say that, but then I forget. They have margin. They've chosen the better thing. And I have to remind myself of that. And what happens oftentimes is when we're stressed out, when we have no margin, when we have no buffer or wiggle room, we lash out and we look around and we point out how much time other people seem to have. That's, that's not helpful. But know that when you are starting to find margin, when you tell somebody, listen, I'm sorry, but I can't be at that Bible study tonight, or I can't be at that dinner tonight, or I can't go to that event tonight because I need to be home with my family, because I have something else that is important that I need to do. When you say that to somebody and build margin in your life, be ready for someone to come to you and say, well, you are idle, and you should get more involved, and you should be busier. And you know who says that more often than not? The people who have no margin. The Marthas of this world will look at you and say, you need to be busier. Do we need to be busier with, I, with not important things? No. So we need to think, we need to be prepared for this. And by the way, this is exactly what Jesus experienced in the book of Matthew in chapter 11. You remember when they were calling John the Baptist and Jesus who John the Baptist didn't eat with people. Jesus did eat with people. And what do they say to Jesus? What do they call Jesus? They called him a drunkard and a glutton for eating with people. They accused him of some very terrible things. But what was he doing? He chose the better thing, right? He said no to having dinner with the Pharisees so he could say yes to having dinner with the tax collectors and the sinners who needed him as the great physician. And so be prepared to have name, names called at you. Be prepared to have people accuse you of things when you start to find more margin because it makes people who are acting like Martha very uncomfortable to know that somebody else is being able to, to build margin in their lives. The last point, last observation is that Jesus is not impressed by marginlessness. I know marginlessness is not a word. Autocorrect kept trying to correct me on this one, but I just put it there anyway. Jesus was not impressed by marginlessness. 
When Martha comes to him and she says, look at all the things that I'm doing and I'm, I'm working and tell my sister to help me, Jesus didn't say, oh, well, look at all the amazing things you're doing. Good for you, Martha, for being so busy. Jesus was not impressed. Jesus is not impressed when my calendar is full. Jesus is not impressed when my to-do list is completely out of control. Jesus is not impressed when my bank account is barely getting by. Jesus is not impressed. And that's actually what we see in the judgment scene in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. There will be a lot of people who said, we were very productive and fruitful for you. Lord, do we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And they'll hold up all the busyness, all of their marginlessness, all the things that they did. They'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. I am not impressed. Jesus is not impressed when, when we are busy. And so when we, when we think about our own busyness and we hold it up and we, as this virtuous glory, oh, I'm so busy, look how productive I am. Well, I don't think Jesus is going to be impressed if we're being busy about the wrong things. Now, being busy about good and better things is different. But being busy with meaningless, trivial things that just keep us from doing what we're supposed to be doing. When I come home at the end of a long day, just have spent every moment of every day just, just going from here to there and doing this and that, never really producing anything for the Lord, never being active for Him, and I just crash. Do you think that is what Jesus is impressed with? So we need to think seriously about how we view our busyness and not glorify it, not hold it up. Because Jesus doesn't want us to be busy with all of these meaningless things. As he said, one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So we need to choose the good portion as well. So let's close the lesson by just asking a few quick, helpful questions. And these are questions that... Frankly, you have to answer for yourself. I can't answer these for you. I've answered these for, for me, but you need to answer these questions for you. So think about these things. What are some specific steps that you can take to reduce stress in your life? Think about maybe before that question, what is causing you stress? And how can you say no to some maybe good things to be able to say yes and have room to say yes to better things. Think about in your finances even. Do you have enough money to share with those who are in need? Do you have enough money to, to give to those who would, who would need from you? Do you have enough time in your schedule to visit the widows and the sick, to visit folks in the hospital, to get involved in people's lives? Do you have enough time in your life to study God's word? Do you have enough time in prayer? Do you have enough time to connect with a brother or sister? Do you have enough energy to do those things? Do you have enough willpower and willingness to do those things? And, and if there's things that are preventing you and blocking you from doing the better things, then you need to say no to them. But first, you have to identify what they are so that you can say no to them. How have you seen your intimacy with God and others decrease as a result of not having enough margin? Are you as active as you need to be? Are you as generous as you need to be? Do you have enough room? Do you have enough buffer in your time, in your energy, in your schedule, in, in everything, in your finances, to be able to do the work that God wants you to do? Or is your relationships with others suffering, especially with God? What are you putting before God? What did, Ma what did Martha put before God? What did Martha put before Jesus? The casserole. What are you placing before God? And it's a question that, that I can answer for, my, for myself. Hopefully you will answer for yourself. And maybe most importantly for this lesson, how can you put God first this week? This week. Just take it week by week. You don't even have to make grand, sweeping, broad goals for the next year. Just take it week by week. How can you put God first this week? A specific step, a specific way that you can decide to put God first and to put all of your other busyness 
away. Let it go. Just a few personal questions. Hopefully these things are helpful for you. If